All of you are in trouble again. Bears! No, blood bears are nice. Panthers are bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think Panthers are so slow because they're so methodical and they're like, alright. <laughs> Test! Okay, so, a couple things. First off, I'll talk about this in one second. We had a test last Friday. And I got graded. A few of you did not do the short answer question correctly. A few of you, okay, we had a misinterpretation of the directions. Some of you just didn't read the directions. If I put down see me, you have to redo one of the uh, short answer question you did not do. So pick up one of the other two. Write all three of those short IDs. And if you still have a question, just see me at, at launch. We'll, we'll get it resolved. But hopefully, like, oh, I already did it wrong. Pick one of those three, redo it, and I'll give you the points, and then we can add those to your score, okay? That question, everyone got that? So you got to get short answer questions. Now, on the AP exam, which is going to be tomorrow, so I hope you're ready. <laughs> the AP exam, which is going to be May 18th or 19th, one of those two days. Today, really? Yeah. It's only, it's only a week. But a week is still a week. And... You're going to have a choice, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly how we're going to do it, but either you're going to do it on computer, you're going to type it, or you're going to do it hand, handwritten. And there are advantages to both. I, I believe handwritten, handwritten is easier to uh, to get your information down. Handwritten, it's either to be easier to be a little more complex. It's easier to skip things when you know. That's a bad thing. Handwritten, you, you, don't, you get everything in. You don't, you don't miss stuff. But at the same time, some of the type out. And, and also, if you type in a pretty good at it, it's less hard on your hands. So th there's advantages. But the big difference is this. On the, the handwritten, okay, both have 55 multiple choice. 55 multiple choice. Both have a DBQ. So we got that, right? If you do it handwritten, you're going to have three of those short answer questions. So that's nine short IDs. Three set, nine three set short IDs, right? A deep, the guards at the DBQ and a long essay, so a five paragraph essay, which is like another three short IDs. In a, okay. Typing, you're going to have six short answer questions and one DBQ. No essay? No, no essay. Now, see, I see advantages to both. You'll have a little bit of choice when you handwrite, but I think short answer questions, I um, got another stuff. You got to know the stuff, but if you know it, I think there might be easier yeah. in the essay. Yeah. And so let's think about it. I'll give you more details when I get, but we still have a few weeks to decide. All right. So let's go ahead then and start World War One. And before we get this, okay, I got a couple more sheets for videos, and there's also a handout for um, uh, some reading on, on the Treaty of Versailles. And the ratification battle in the United States. That's what we call a hint for a DBQ. I don't know, but it could be anything. So just throwing out ideas. But then you know, in the last two pages, there are two different things. First one is the Espionage Act, and we will turn this in. This is close to get to like a regular worksheet. You know, it's not. But we will do that. This is a law. Technically, still on part of it, still on the books in the United States. And the other one you see right above are two maps. The two maps you have to have done by Friday. It's, it's, the U, it's Europe in 1914, and then the dramatic changes after World War I. I'll put a generic date in 1920, even though those borders still won't be quite set yet. And we just follow the direction, no sweat. Sound good? That's by Friday. I make my own. This whole thing? The map. Yeah. The, the movies we're watching class. The, uh, the the reading I will sign when I get near the DBQ, so probably on Friday. And let me think of anything else. It's good to see all of you. Yeah. I don't know, but we know there's some. Yeah. Yes. Are we doing block schedule? Are we doing block schedule only for fourth period? Okay. So after that. 
No, we're not. It doesn't look like we're into block scheduling, which I'm relieved yeah. because I thought it was a lot more dangerous, even though I understand why some classes want longer periods. Yes. As I understand it, as I understand it, we're going to have basically this schedule we have now. And there, there might, there's going to be a variation because they have not come up with how they're going to do lunch exactly. So we might actually have a little bit longer lunch, and that means start a little bit earlier. Yeah, that's 4 a.m. But no, let's start like 10 minutes early. I, but all that's still in the air. It's going to be this basic schedule. To be honest, I wish we could have 50 minutes, but um, you know, the shorter you're in one room and able to get out and let air circulate, you know, since it's all aerosol, and we just want this thing to end. And there is, there might be light at the end of the tunnel. So if we all are relatively responsible, maybe the tunnel so we can get out of the tunnel. How's that for metaphors? And then we have two birds in one hand. And I also feel like I might go crazy if I'm in some headlines like this an hour. Like I might lose my mind. Anyone else? No. Okay. What about this class? Come this on. This is fine, but my hands. Are, I, I would get tired from writing. Yeah, yeah. This class would not. By the way, I like the this class. It's it's fine. <laughs> no, this is my favorite class. But, like, it's better than kick it. Oh, good try. Good, good, one. good try. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Better than kicking the shin. All right, so. But, um, so everyone got, as I know any more information, I'll keep it from you as soon as I can. So let's get to World War One. And World War One. this is, I can't even begin to tell you how this would change everything. The first industrial war, so many horrific things about war, about the way societies would function, the most horrific states in world history will come out of World War One. Fascism is a direct result of World War One. Direct, straight line. Even though it's unfair to say it's part two, World War Two is not exactly part two of this thing. It kind of is too. And then virtually every problem we see today has many of its roots in World War One, including you go to the Middle East, it was all just chopped up by the victorious powers after World War One, Countries like, let me throw a couple out that might have a few problems right now, let's say like Iraq, how do do this, or Syria. And so World War One, this horrific fight, I gotta pick and choose certain things to cover on this, but we do gotta talk about the fighting and there's a little bit of European history we have to know. Because the United States is now gonna be intimately involved in this. We still have hundreds of thousands of troops in Europe right now. Which is very odd. Europe is incredibly strong, and we still have troops there. So the legacy goes on from World War One into World War Two. These are Germans. It's 1918, and this kind of shows many of you know. When think about World War One. Okay, they're in a hastily dug trench, but they're in a trench. Machine guns would come become to personify the fighting, even though it would not be co even close to the biggest killer. And then you notice the gas masks. Yes. Artillery. Can modern artillery is the biggest killer, and you know the helmets. Everybody copies the German helmet today, the German World War One helmet. The United States would adopt that helmet in 1980, a different version of it, but that's when the U.S. Would. Everybody copies the German helmet. Weird that they have the spike. Huh? Weird that they have the spike. 19. Well, they had that all through the early, the first uh, 20 years or so. <laughs> Uh, 20, the, the 20 years before the war. So like 1895 to like 1914. But it, the spike, I mean, it made no sense. It was decorated with just a little piece of metal there. It's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's not as cool as like a Mohawk. But, but they, and they got the, and Mohawks come out of World War II. Here's another picture. I thought, yes, it's Germans again, but I want to show you another shot of the horses with gas masks. <laughs> kind of do, don't they? I never thought of that. The poor horses, but both World War World Wars would just chew up horses. More in World War II, because it was such a bigger war, but still. And this was at a time, everybody knew war was coming, and there's gonna be this whole array of these kind of caricatured maps, hundreds of them. And they're gonna show like little caricatures of the various countries, and they're kind of creepy and funny at the same time. So we have Russia, and it's the Germans with the bayonets in the nose. And I have, I have no idea what Italy is here. <laughs> Britain is just creepy. France is just like a mushed up thing. Look at Belgium. It's a revolver pointed at France. Creepy. 
a lot of people did not like Serbia and blame them for all the problems. They looked at Serbia as a pig. Montenegro is a bug. This is also very. Um, They're not aiming very well at science. Yeah, I think it's had to make it fit. So let's get to the factors that led to war. Because there's going to be all these factors. The U.S. is going to go through this too. So some of these will seem familiar. And then we'll see elements of this all through the 20th century and through today. So the first one, all the changes in industrialization. And so all the great powers in Europe were industrializing. Germany was relatively unindustrialized when it became an empire in 1871. And by 1913, it's going to be rivaling the United States in economic power. And Germany just exploded. At the same time, they had a, uh, uh, a guy by the name of Kaiser Wilhelm in charge. We'll get to him. And so you have all of these, first off, we talked about this before, but all the inequalities. And not just inequalities of wealth. Industrialization and capitalism does, by its very nature, focus money to those who have the capital. And that can cause a lot of problems. As you have more and more people who um, are seeing this wealth, seeing this power, more people are living longer, they want to be something. And so you have these inequalities, but not just up in country, within countries. Countries that industrialize first and fastest have huge advantages over countries that didn't. <laughs> you have to redo the whole thing. I'm kidding. That's a terrible joke. One that I said about no, we will get it. Give you one second. Why would this work? Everybody relax. If this doesn't work, I will be so mad. I will take your computer and break it. I gave you a packet. All right, so let's, where were we? Vietnam? <laughs> All right, so by the way, that's Manchester, England. Manchester. <laughs> yes. Inequalities of wealth and what? Or inequalities between countries. So the countries that industrialize first have a huge advantage. And we'll see this with the countries that industrialize first and start conquering everybody. And the countries like Spain uh, that were way behind or Russia that's going to be frantically trying to catch up. And to a lot, you'll see with you Germany and, and Japan, they did kind of catch up. Even though they still had a lot of the old system that would remain. I'm sure that won't cause any problems. But also, you have the growing socialist and communist movements of a different path to take. And you'll see this different path. You know, this growing idea that perhaps there's a revolution. We've talked about this feeling of revolution. And then don't forget all the anarchists. I know they're they're socialists, but there's assassinations all over, terrorist attacks. Various world leaders for the Prime Minister of Russia, Hulk, uh, tech in Austria, a number of their cabinet, and uh, um, the Kaiserina, Kaiser I've got to get it pronounced right, but the wife of their emperor was assassinated, Kaiserina, was assassinated by anarchists, and don't forget President McKinley was assassinated. There is this feeling by 1910 that Armageddon was coming. They talk about it all the time. You see some really amazing paintings of this time of this fear of Armageddon, of disruption. They figure it'd be some kind of like disruption of society and war is coming. And there's a lot of fatalistic attitudes like, well, there's war going to be, if it's going to happen, let's just do it. A lot of that attitude, which is actually pretty terrifying. You know, it's really easy for people to act tough, but when they really have to do it, they don't know the consequences. In fact, nobody really knows the consequences. Who could have predicted what's going to happen? It literally would be Armageddon. Next, this rapidly changing world, and you have all these old monarchs. 
And I put down 17th century just generically saying that, okay, you know, in the 1600s, that's when we start getting the ideas of a constitution and a parliament, yet the monarchs are still in charge. And so you have these old systems where monarchs, they thought they got their power from whom? God. Yeah, their divine right, they think. Their power and their kids have that power because they're born with power, therefore they're better. And you have a growing idea too in many of these places that people need representation. There's a growing movement for constitutions and parliaments and something crazy called democracy. This personifies, this picture, the intermingling of all these royal families that were on top. And I should add, they're very isolated from the rest of their population. So this is Queen Victoria at her 60th, her Diamond Jubilee as her 60th anniversary of her being Queen of England. Queen Victoria. And these are members of royal families throughout Europe that are all directly related to her. All of them. So, for example, here's her son. It's going to be King Edward VII. His son, which ooh, King George V. Yeah, my, <laughs> there's so many of them. Then his son would be King George VI. Get it? That's the Tsar, which means Kaiser, which means Caesar of Russia. This guy right here is Kaiser Wilhelm II. He's the Emperor of Germany. His grandmother was Queen Victoria. They're all interrelated. In fact, Tsar Nicholas, that's her cousin. He married her niece. Oh, wait. Don't. Oh, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. Oh, actually, this is not Kaiser Wilhelm yet. He's still not yet Kaiser. That's his his father. He, he is Kaiser. He's going to die for a for about a year into his reign. So this is going to be personified more than any other two people. The first one is Kaiser Wilhelm. Kaiser William, Kaiser Bill, as he was known in the U.S. and Germany, and this is 19. This is about 1910. So he's he's honor guard. By the way, he made sure they're all very tall. You know that. And the Kaiser. Here's the thing about a monarch. In a hereditary monarch, you're stuck with whoever the oldest in this context, oldest son is. You're stuck with them. And even though they had a parliament called a Reichstag, and they didn't have some voting power, he controlled the army, he controlled who's going to be the head of state, he controlled foreign policy, he controlled everything. And do you see it? Do you see what will be the cause of unending? Um, I got my, my, I ran out of words there. <laughs> no, I suddenly caught my eye outside. A head pop. And you know, it's weird when like, ah, oh, and then I forgot everything. That always happens in your videos when you're at home. You're like, oh, sorry, I was looking out the window. Yeah, I know. All the wild ones. That does happen. Like, oh, quicker. Okay, so with that. So, but uh, 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 he had no self esteem. And he was always trying to prove himself. Always. The German emperor, who was also the king of Prussia, was supposed to be a great warrior. And do you see it? Do you see his problem? He's short. Not short. I feel like they should break down. Like they should make. He he's actually taller than average, but his honor guard was all of them. They're all of them too. If you was insecure, why would he get smaller people to look bigger? Huh? If you was super insecure, why would he get smaller people to look bigger? Because yeah. that happens all the time. You want these big guys to show, look, I'm in charge. Okay. Even these big men, I'm in charge. They come. I can make do anything I want. Do you see it? Yes. Wearing a dress. Sword. Sweet. One arm. One arm. His, arm. his left arm got wrapped behind his back in childhood, and so it never grew properly. It was a it was a withered left arm. It was small, only about the third the size. A hand could hardly move. So he's almost always like. Bent, so you can't see how long it is holding something. So you can't see the little tiny fingers. So he's always like this. So how could the great warrior have a withered arm? And so he's always desperately trying to prove that he's tough. 
And his father would hire tutors who literally beat the crap out of him to try to get him to ride a horse. Think how hard it would be to ride a horse with one hand when you're a little kid. He would fall off, he'd beat him, put him back on the horse. So he had this constant problem where he wanted to prove how tough he was. So when he became the emperor as a very young man, when his father died suddenly, he was insecure, he's very arrogant, bombastic, and desperate to prove his domination. He would work hours to make his right arm strong. He would go out and chop wood, one arm with an ax. If you've ever chopped wood, you know how difficult and also kind of scary to chop wood with one arm. His arm got powerful. So he would do things like, and trust me, this is not normal. He would shake hands with somebody and he would grab their hand and squeeze it so hard that they would start to scream. Sometimes he would hold their hand as they went down in agony, sometimes even cracking and breaking knuckles, talking to someone else casually as they're screaming in pain. That's not normal. <laughs> and he has the strongest arm. Huh? Yeah, a very strong arm. Chopping wood. So having an insecure man like that, he's going to make stupid decisions time after time. Fortunately, he was kind of lazy. But by 1914... Can't be lazy anymore. The enemy, who is also his cousin, Tsar Nicholas II. He's his cousin too. What a weird though. Yeah, boy. Well, here. This is Rasputin. Oh, never mind. But Tsar Nicholas II, same deal. Here is a man because he was the eldest son of Tsar Alexander. He became monarch. By the way, keeping in the tradition of monarchs, he and his father hated each other. He was not the sharpest person. He couldn't make a decision. He could be bullied. Sometimes really very intelligent people can't make a decision because they think of a thousand different things. He didn't have that problem. He couldn't make a decision because he couldn't think. Okay, he did have a good family life. Yes, he was married to uh, Victoria's um, niece, too. Uh, what is Russian? We'll and so here's a man, but in Russia, he's the total autocrat. He controls the entire state. And he is a god on earth, and yet here is this little kind of dunce who's in charge. And they kind of kept it secret, but there was a revolution in 1905. He had lost the Russian Japanese War, and he couldn't get an heir. He and his wife had four daughters. In Russia, the heir has to be a man. They finally had a son, Alexis. But Alexis had a problem that was passed on by his great aunt, Victoria. She was a carrier of the hemophilia gene. He was a he hemophilia. What's a hemophilia? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, 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 the blood does not uh, clot. There's no platelets. It's not a cut that's bad. That's not the bad part. It's a bruise. You get internal bleeding. I guess the pain is so bad it's incomprehensible. It begins to press and swell against it because it just keeps bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. There's no way to stop the blood. I cut here, you put pressure on it, eventually it might stop. Why, why do I keep going here? But, uh, <laughs> and, and so he'd been agony all the time. But the czars of God on earth, so they, they couldn't tell anybody that the heir was a hemophiliac. So they kept that secret. Well, every time he would fall down, he's in agony for weeks. But they found this monk from Siberia who just kind of happened to show up. We're not going to go through all of the details of how this man named Rasputin came. And he seemed to bring comfort to Alexis, which we still don't understand why. He must have had, you know, that kind of, I think part of it was just uh, the ability to make, make Alexis feel like he's doing something. And gain the trust of the royal family. And so Rasputin was in the royal family giving sometimes good, sometimes bad advice. But then he'd go off into on the town in St. Petersburg and drink more than any human has ever drank and corralled and just seemed like this lecherous, corrupt person. And so we have an inadequate czar that's kind of secret. Nobody knows about the, the uh, disease that poor Alexis has. And why is this guy hit there at all? And all kinds of rumors about him that he might be having an affair with the Tsarina, that... Um, 
Do you want to give a disastrous advice? And this is the problem with these monarchies. You're stuck with whomever's in charge and the desperation for an heir, and decisions he and the Kaiser will make will plunge the entire world to war. By the way, this could also be spelled T-S-A-R. And so Tsar. And it means Caesar, just like Kaiser means Caesar. Yeah. And so let's get to number. Oh, speaking of that, here's. And by the way, Nicholas, I yeah, maybe I'll tell you some stories about him. That's our Nicholas the second. That's King George the fifth of England. Yeah, don't they look like? Okay, they look like brothers, right? Not quite twins, maybe. But small country spur day. Nobody will notice. <laughs> Interbred leader. Don't marry your cousin. Write that down. Don't be Rudy Giuliani. Okay, next. Imperialism. Yes, Rudy Giuliani. You only marry your second cousin. It's your cousin. Okay, so. <laughs> Imperialism. Okay, we know about imperialism, and we talked about the wars for empire. We have all these imperial powers, and they're fighting, they build large armies, they build these police states to control empires. And this map I show, most of the world was part of somebody's empire. They're conquering everybody. And since the vast majority of the people are now subject to somebody else, they might not want to be part of an empire. This is best personified by Africa in 1914. In 1878, most of Africa was still independent kingdoms. They were weakened because of slave trade and various other things. But by 1914, every part of Africa had been taken over by European powers, except Ethiopia. They beat back the Italians. <laughs> 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 yeah, they humiliate the towns here in Ottawa. <laughs> and Liberia. We've mentioned Liberia before. Remember the American Colonization Society were former slaves from Central Africa? But it's they kind of run Liberia, so it's not really independent, it's complex. Everybody else, I mean, look at the massive French Empire. I know most of it's desert, but it's huge. Belgian Congo, Britain controls all this. Germany. Portugal, yes. Oh, wait, no, no. And this personified this this rush for empire and prestige, but it'd be even bigger, no, more noticeable in Europe itself. Central Europe is dominated by three empires: the massive, but now getting very weak, Austro-Hungarian Empire or Austria, the German Empire, and Russia. And they are all. They all have common borders. They all have rivalries. They've gone to war, nearly gone to war many times. In fact, over a place here called Bosnia, Austria and Russia nearly went to war in 1908. The only reason they didn't is because Russia just lost to Japan. They didn't want to fight another war again. But they couldn't fight another war. Not only that, in the Arabian Peninsula, it's the Ottoman Empire, the Turks. And so with that, we're leading to the next thing, nationalism. We've talked about nationalism before, but remember nationalism, remember the whole thing about the United States after the War of 1812 started calling themselves American, you know, this is our continent. So that is, oh, lunch is here. What do we have today? What do we want? Pizza. Who wants pizza? Who wants pizza? Raise your hand. Who wants chicken alfredo? We got three chicken alfredo, one pizza. Who wants a sandwich? And one sandwich. <laughs> you don't want fake, fake Italian food? <laughs> three, chi three chicken and two, two pizza, right? No, I think. Right? One sandwich, one pizza. Yeah, one sandwich, one pizza. Well, I've got ham or peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. Yeah. How about ham, peanut butter, and jelly? <laughs> Come on, live on the edge. With some Alfredo sauce. <laughs> okay, that's just kind of me. Thank you very much. Okay, so intense devotion to the state. 
But it's also, what about those places that don't have their own country? They want political independence, and that is also nationalism. We want our own state. This is best personified by a Slavic people that used to be a kingdom, but they lost it at the end of the 18th century. There is no Poland. Yet there are millions of Poles. They want their own country. Well, you can see the same thing with the Czechs or the Hungarians, but you also have you know, the French want to expand where there's more French speaking people. Italy desperately wants this area in here. They see this, that is their uh, legacy to have those areas. So, but basically what it is, all these different areas, they have certain independent national identities, mostly based upon language or ethnic group or a combination of those. And so one thing that, what made people Poles? They were Slavs who speak Polish. What makes someone a, a Slovenian? They're a, Slo they're a Slav who speaks Slovenian. And so, and Austrians are Germans. Hmm? What makes them different? They call themselves Austrians. I mean, what makes anybody different? It's slightly different, you know. Everyone else speaks different language, and then Austrians just call themselves Austrians. It, it, it goes back to Austria is older than Germany. So, but no place would this be bigger in Europe than the Slavs. The Slavs are Eastern and Central Europeans, and they want their own, more and more there's talk of a Slavic state. Pan means that unified together. Pan-Slavism. And this is Slavic nationals, the very Slavic peoples. And the Slavic peoples are going to be Poles, most Russians, but there'll be a significant number of Slavs in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In fact, if both Czechs, Austrians, and Hungarians, and then the rest of the people are mostly Slavs. And they want to be independent. They want independent Slavic states. So they go on maybe be part of a Poland, or part of a Ukraine, or their own state, Transylvania, which never happened, or in Croatia, or Slo Slovakia. But Serbia is another newly independent Slavic state. Serbia are Slav, and they want to rally these Slavs to do what? You're exactly right. How do you be Serbians? Rebel. And create a big Serbia. They literally called it Greater Serbia. After World War I, you might have heard of this. They still call themselves Yugoslavia. They want Serbia. Okay, Serbia had um, literally fought their way out of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They are a country based upon a brutal, long war. They were seen as almost barbarians in Europe, even though they all are pretty much barbarians. If you think about what's going to happen in Europe. But they, because of this, are now direct mortal enemies to Austria. Austria is trying to hold this big empire together. And here's Serbia trying to drum up anti-Austrian feeling within Austria, hoping they rebel and become part of a big Serbia especially focused on a place called Bosnia, right here, just on the northern border. In fact, the capital of Serbia, Belgrade, is literally just across the, the Danube from uh, Austria. And that's just right there. Huh? Big river. Big river! It's a, it's a massive river that goes across Central Europe. Um, so, one more thing. I already told you, what's the largest Slavic country? And Russia sees themselves as the protector of the Slavs. So they are allied with, they're allied with Serbia. Partially because they hate Austria. Fuck Austria. Maybe not then. I could tell you stories about then, though. Well, that push does not push Russia against Aust against Austria. Austria only has one ally. 
Germany sees it as it's our vested interest to keep Austria together. So that means, I think you might see what's going on here. If Russia's ally with Serbia and Serbia and Germany and Serbia and Austria are enemies, that means Austria and Russia are enemies. But what else does it mean? Potential enemies. And so the Balkans, this peninsula, oh, it's, and I'm doing the very easy version. It's called the Balkan Peninsula. And you have all these different nationalities, different ethnic groups, different languages. Also, some of the uh, largest population of Jews in the world, too, at this time are right here. And so look at how much the, um, look at Austria and look out to the wall. That's why we have the two different maps to do, because it's just a told it. And it's going to change again. It's going to change again in the 1990s. This will evolve or devolve into a horrible civil war in the 1990s. Unbelievable war, a bloody and awful it was. So with that, and then we have German nationalists. Is this the, this one? No, this sticks with the nationalists. Germany was developing their own national identity. Germany was created in 1871, but they had developed this massive industrial base. And there were a bunch of different principalities, different kingdoms. It's a German empire. The king of Prussia, which their capital is Berlin, he'd become the emperor of Germany. But there is still, for example, a king of Bavaria at this time. So this weird hodgepodge, they needed something to say, you're no longer Bavarians or hamburgers, you're Germans. And so they created this kind of German myth, a myth of German, a myth of German superiority, that there's something special about being a German. So it doesn't matter if you're from Westphalia or you're from Brandenburg, or you're from Holstein. Yes, the cows come from there. It doesn't matter. You're all Germans. So this was partially old myths and partially completely made up. And also, remember that hierarchy of race I showed you with John Fitz? It comes out of that science of that racial science science that was coming out of the 1890s. And they called German superiority German culture. Germany was the center of philosophy, of um, composition, of science, of industry. Look how great Germany has done industrially in just 30 years. And the most powerful military is because of German superiority. And everybody is jealous and everybody's our enemy. They want to bring us down. And this is Germanica. This is a statue in Koblenz along the Rhine. And this is a postcard from 18 uh, or 1900. Most cars are like the new craze. And this a kind of like Lady Liby, Liberty or Lady Columbia. And look at Germany. It's surrounded by potential enemies, isn't it? And so German culture would be such a big deal. By the way, this is a, a, a medal from World War I. You notice World War I, because they put the date when the war began. So like World War II, they'd have 1939 for Germany. But culture. And here's the thing, what made Germany, German culture superior? By the way, this is then therefore a proper noun, culture, means German superiority. It's racial. They took the trash racial science of the late 19th century, and they took that and created a race for Germans called Aryans. And they must preserve this Aryan race. So this came out of this German idea, desire for an identity in the 1880s, 1890s. So people think, you know, this was Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany did this. No, they were piggybacking on already existing German feelings. And after World War One, when they were humiliated, they took advantage of Germans who wanted to uh, have their place in the sun again. And so here is a postcard for little kids. And it shows little Germany being attacked by everybody since 1914. So this is during World War I. So here's France, the United States, Russia, Britain, vague Arabia, just go with me on that, Italy, vague Africa, vague China. Everybody's out to get and It's very racially tinged. Like race, truly right? made up. Huh? Don't bog yourself down. <laughs> but France also had their own intense nationalism. And France lost for lots of reasons against in the Franco-Prussian War. 
against basically Germany. And they lost two big provinces, Alsace and Lorraine, and they won them back. And so that became the center of France, of French politics, of French nationalism, to take them back from Germany. And so everything is focused on Germany. The German population was growing so much faster than France, they had a big advantage. And there's French soldiers, four French soldiers in red and blue, I know. And so that leads to the next biggie. Fifth. The alliance system. No one power in Europe. Yes. Everyone write down alliances in the arms race. Lost provinces, Alsatia and Lorraine. Beautiful area. There are actually Germans there, but then after World War II, the French drove all the Germans out. Okay, there are two alliances because no one country is going to be strong enough to go out alone. Germany has the strongest army, Britain has the strongest fleet. So we're going to write down the Triple Alliance first. The Triple Alliance is going to be an alliance of basically two countries in one of them. The two countries in this alliance we see in red, Germany and Austria, are stuck together. Or as Germany would say during the war, we're shackled to a corpse. Nice dark humor. And then Italy, for imperial reasons, kind of rivalries with France, they join the alliance too. But Italy and Austria hated each other. Wait, so it's German, uh, German, Austria, Italy. But Italy was never seen as a, a close ally. Italy wants this piece of Austria. They would get it after the war. And so Italy, when the war began, Italy said, doesn't meet our conditions of the alliance. And then in 1915, Italy turned around and declared war on Austria and Germany. If an ally declares war on you, that, by definition, is a bad ally. <laughs> so can we trust you? <laughs> yeah, the United States would never break a treaty. Next, the Triple Entente. The Triple Entente. France and England and Russia. So what two countries have the Iron Alliance? France and Russia. France and Russia. So everyone got that? The blue. Britain, France, and, and Russia. Russia and France had an iron alliance. Britain had an understanding, and that's what it taught me. Britain had no alliance. All right, on that note, we will finish this up. Got a lot of stuff to do tomorrow. Have a good day. Grab your lunch. Enjoy yourself. Mention my name.